Hello, my name is Michael Santos and I'm with Earning Freedom. I'm here today to practice for a rehearsal that I'll be doing for the Safe Schools Conference. I was invited and honored actually to be giving a presentation and a workshop at the Restorative Justice Con Conference. It's going to be held in Orange County in July of 2017 and I'll have the privilege of introducing our Straight A Guide program to superintendents of schools, probation officers, to um, sheriffs, to any individual who is interested in building a community of safe schools. Because communities really begin with children, as we all know. But in our society today, we have a lot of competing influences that are leading some young children into making bad decisions. And I know that people who work in schools have a real responsibility for nurturing children to grow into the most productive citizens, law-abiding, contributing citizens that they are able to. But sometimes that can be a heavy lift, particularly for educators and law enforcement officers that work with at-risk youth. It's a heavy lift because those individuals find themselves working with young people who may not really get the message. And so despite the, the, the countless hours that teachers and, and leaders invest in the young people, these people sometimes learn a lesson but then go on to make bad decisions and fall, fall back down. And so it feels like they're, they're rolling this hill, rolling this rock up a hill like the myth of Sisyphus. And as soon as they get the rock to the top of the hill, that rock rolls right back down. That's got to be the feeling that many people experience when they're dealing with a young individual who continuously makes decisions that are leading them onto a path of difficulty and struggle. But it's really important to continue that fight. It's really important to continue so that we can stop this cycle of recidivism, this cycle of building more prisons and locking more people up. Because once we bring people into that environment, it's very difficult to, to get out. As you can see from the recidivism rates that are published throughout the United States, the, the earlier somebody goes into the criminal justice system, the more likely that individual is to have continuing series of problems. Problems that can complicate life going forward. And it doesn't only end with the individual, it goes on with the individual's family. Their children become wards of the state or back into the system. So it's really crucial that as educators, we work as a community, tapping into all resources so that we can understand why. What are the reasons that people get involved in crime? What are the motivations and inspirations that lead them into making decisions that all too frequently bring them out of the educational system and into the prison system? Once they come into the prison system, what do they experience? What challenge do they have in adjustment? Well, they go through a series of apathy for many of them, where they become drawn instead of to books and literature and learning and mentors, they fall in with gangs and negativity and retaliation and all types of problems that just complicate their lives going forward. And it's our job to try and break that cycle, to break that cycle of struggle. And as I said, we need to tap into all resources, not only the well-educated, the psychologists, the, you know, the, the learned people, but also even the formerly incarcerated, people who started making bad decisions in schools, but yet through the principles of restorative justice, have found their way into coming back into society just as every taxpaying citizen would want somebody who's going through struggle to come back into the society. It's all about the choices that we make. I was one of those young men, an at-risk youth who made bad decisions. And in making bad decisions, I just chose the wrong role models. In my case, it was Tony Montana who led me into making bad decisions. During the recklessness of youth, I was about 20 years old when I saw the movie for the first time. And I got so inspired that I didn't see it as a work of entertainment, but rather I looked at it as, as a blueprint to start my life, to have the type of fun that I wanted to have in life. And it's because of that story that I can help educators communicate this message to young people because they can identify with being influenced by role models who lead us into the wrong direction. But what happens 
when somebody has made those bad decisions and they go into the, out of the education system and into the criminal justice system. At that point, how are they defining success? When they're sitting inside of a jail cell, when they're being peered upon, looked upon by their peers, and they're trying to define themselves or define success by the images that they can create. And all too often in that environment, they are not being nurtured by great educators. They are not being nurtured by leaders. Instead, they're being influenced by the people around them who are telling them that the way to survive in this environment is to develop a ball of hate in your stomach and a knife and to become the worst, the best of the worst criminals. That's how they're looking for to define themselves. And it's our job to break that cycle. So they're not looking for the wrong role models but rather they are looking for what they can become. And they do that how? By introspecting, by looking back, by thinking about what role they have in their communities, what role they have in their society. And that's the story that I strive to, to present. That's the resource that I try to give to young people and to students and to staff members who work with young people who are in struggle. I do it by sharing my own story of how I learned while I was in a jail cell to introspect. introspect. And for me, it all started by reading the story of Socrates. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Socrates, but when I was in prison, I was flipping through a book and I happened to find the first story of how this incredible man of wisdom and honor was in a jail cell awaiting his execution. And when I learned of how he responded when he had an opportunity to escape that execution, that was what changed my life. That was what caused me to stop thinking about myself and start thinking about the broader community. Start thinking about what role I could have in building a better community. That's the principle, the essence, the essence of restorative justice. It's helping us all really think about what we can do to connect to connect with the people that we have hurt and the people that we want to help. In my case, I called those people my avatars. I was in a jail cell. I was facing the possibility of life without parole, wondering what kind of sentence I was going to receive. And I started to project, because I was inspired by Socrates, what, if anything, I could do while I was in here to come back successfully. And I called those, I started to think, stop thinking about how challenged I was to be in here, but instead started thinking about the people I would meet in the future. People like everybody here in this audience. Teachers, sheriffs, law enforcement, counselors, law-abiding citizens. Is there anything that I could do to prove worthy of them? Is there anything that I could do to prove worthy of a second chance? Or to show that I could become something more than the bad decisions I started making when I was 20? And the answer was yes, there, there probably is. I just wasn't finding that message in the areas where I was confined. And I wish that I would have had that message when I was in high school, starting to go down the bad path. But it wasn't about regretting or only thinking about what I could do differently. See, I couldn't change the past, but I could change the future. And how? I had to start working to build trust to build trust through transparency, to be authentic, to demonstrate that I truly wanted to change my life. And I would do that by drawing a line in the sand. Once I read, once I read that story of Socrates, I really began to believe that this is the time to begin influencing my future. This is the time to begin working toward reconciling with society, with the people that I hurt. And so I remember getting on the edge of my bed, my cell block, in a cell block, on a concrete bed, and grabbing a tiny pencil and beginning to write a letter to a newspaper, the newspaper that had covered my trial when I was convicted. And I told them that I was going to change my life, that I was going to spend every day of my life in prison, working to reconcile, working to connect, working to make things better. And in so doing that, uh, by giving that let, writing that letter, a journalist came to visit me and it resulted in a front page story in the newspaper. Now, in that front page story of the newspaper, that's not the exact newspaper article, I just doctored it up with, with Photoshop because I couldn't access the original paper from you know, 30 years ago. 
But basically, I wrote that letter in the newspaper and I got the type of response that I anticipated. People were not so willing to believe. You would know if you saw some story about somebody said he's going to change his life. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to change his life. It just means that he said he is going to change his life. But for me, it was an essential moment. And that's what I try to share. You've got to draw this line in the sand. You've got to say, this is the day that I stop making decisions that are going to lead me on a bad path. And I begin making decisions that are going to put me on a better path reconciling with society. And it's not an easy lift, but it can be done. Jim Collins, the author of the great book, Good to Great, talks about this story with companies. It talks about, I, I found a lot of inspiration from people like Mr. Collins and reading about how people improve and grow and the same strategies and techniques that it takes to build a great company, it turns out that's what it takes to overcome struggle in our life and restore justice, become more, rec to reconcile with society. To start, you gotta push this flywheel, is what he says. And when you start pushing this flywheel, it's very difficult to get that thing moving. But as you push harder, you start getting momentum, and things start to change, and you become better, you become on the path. And it's very important for us to show that message to as many people as we can, and to show that message as early as we can. Because if we can do that, we truly can build safer communities. We truly can set people on a path of success rather than a path of struggle. Jim Collins talks about a big, hairy, audacious goal. That's what companies have to do to become great. And what is a big, hairy, audacious goal? His BHAG, as he says, it's when companies find out what they can be the best in the world at, what their teams can be incredibly passionate about building, what they can earn a, a, a revenue stream that allow it to become sustainable. When you take all those three rings and you find the sweet spot right in the center, that's where you find your big, hairy, audacious goal. It's no different for an individual. An individual in struggle, whether it is an at-risk youth, a young person, an old person, the reality is there's always a path to begin building a better life. But we've got to find that big, hairy, audacious goal that is going to give us the passion and the energy so that we can sustain ourselves while we're going through struggle. And it's important to think not only about ourselves and what we're going through, but we've gotta be able to condition and show people how they can think about the broader community, how they can think about the people they are going to meet in the future, the people they want to influence. And in my case, based upon the learnings that I had from masterminds like Socrates and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and Dr. Martin Luther King and so many others, I learned that I had to ask questions of what my avatars would expect from me. What would a law-abiding citizen, a potential employer, the people I would meet in the future, what would they expect from me? And I realized at that point, what they would expect would be for me to focus on my education, for me to focus on contributing to society, for me to focus on building a support network. Now, if I could teach other people how to do that, I truly believe that I could start making a difference in the world. And so I had to start looking around. What resources do I have that will allow me to work toward educating myself, toward contributing to society, toward building a support network? And you know, the resources that I had in a jail cell were a pen and a piece of paper. Fortunately, I also had a dictionary. And in that dictionary, I found the back pages of it indicate, gave me the, uh, the names of four-year universities across the country. And I simply would use my pen and paper and write letters asking for help, letting them know, my name is Michael Santos. I made some bad decisions when I was a kid. I am in prison, starting a long prison term, and I would love to come out as a law-abiding citizen. Can you help me by allowing me to get an education? And by writing those letters, I had hope. Just the act of doing something, I had hope. But it's tough. You write one letter, maybe nobody responds. You write 10 letters, you got a 10 times chance of getting a response. You write 100 letters, you got a better chance of getting a response. And I got my response when educators like each of you read my letter, some of them wrote back and said, we would like to help. And that's what led me upon this path of persistence where I began with my starting in college and going on and educating myself. And it was all about persistence. Like, you know, you had to focus every day, even while going through struggle, you had to focus on what you wanted to become, which is why it is so important to show 
what we're striving to achieve. Because when you're living without hope, you may not see it. But if you have something you're working toward, that makes all the difference in the world. And while I was in prison, because of that path, I was fortunate or blessed to have these opportunities and earn an undergraduate degree and a master's degree. That was how I defined my commitment to education and my contributions to society. Well, I could define that by publishing. And by, although I went into the prison system not knowing how to write a coherent sentence, by the time I came out, I'd published seven books for myself and dozens of books for other people in prison. I built my support network by writing and connecting and contributing. And through that process, I ended up finding the love of my life while I was in prison. And we married inside of a prison visiting room when I was in my 16th year of confinement, 10 years before I got out of prison. But because of this path that I'm sharing with you and that I want to share with other people, my life changed. I wasn't that young kid that was on a path to destruction. When I came to back to society, I had support all around me and was profiled by the national media. I got my first job three weeks after concluding my sentence by becoming a professor at San Francisco State University. I was able to do all of this because I was able to lift myself out of one pond and jump into a new pond. That's what we strive to show young people how crucial it is to leave the pond of negativity and jump into the pond of opportunity. Now, I would love to say that these were all my ideas, but the reality is these are ideas that I learned from masters. Masters like Steve Jobs who said, good artists copy ideas, but great artists steal ideas. And I just simply stole ideas from leaders who've lived before me people who have gone through struggle and came back strong, corporate leaders who have built great companies, educators who have shaped minds. All of that is what helped me avoid the delirium of imprisonment, where I am really in a, where, we, where it's very easy to fall in this state of thinking this is all there is. There is no going forward. Now you've got to break through that by finding a purpose in your life. That's what we strive to show people in struggle. Show them how to connect. Show them how to love what they're doing. Show them that the world needs it and they need to be a part of it. And show them pathways that they can get paid for doing what they love. That is when we give them a purpose. You give them that sweet spot of where all of these rings interconnect and people have a reason to say no to negativity. They have a reason to develop critical thinking skills. All of it happens with the lessons that masterminds taught me by asking the right questions. What programs can I participate in on this school? What value do participating in these programs have in relating me or preparing me for the type of employment that I want? How will that employment lead to be becoming more aware of ways that I can lead a fulfilling, contributing life as a full member of this community and this society? Well, to help those individuals, I've created this program that I call the Straight A Guide. And the Straight A Guide is really a compass, a compass that teaches us to lead a values-based, goal-oriented life, where we are focusing on defining success on who we are, setting clear goals that determine whether we are authentic as law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, achieving the type of people that we, embark that we want to become, and then pursuing that success with a deliberate path, a deliberate path that I call the straight A guide. And the straight A guide begins with the first A, which is attitude. You gotta have the right attitude. And the right attitude is 100% commitment to success as you've defined success. A, a right attitude leads us to having the right aspiration. And what's the right aspiration? It's seeing ourselves not in struggle that we're living in today, but rather the type of person we are striving to become. We've got to take incremental action steps. And I define this as like planting a tree. To plant a tree, what do we do? We have to plant a seed. But that's not all. We also have to nurture that seed. Feed that seed with fertilizer. And what is fertilizer? We all know what fertilizer is. It's a natural product that uh, animals provide us with. And you gotta go through a lot of those natural products before we achieve our goals. 
It's important for people to realize that, that success doesn't come overnight, but rather it comes through consistent effort, feeding, going through struggle, becoming more, holding ourselves accountable, defining success, measuring success, becoming aware of opportunities that we can seize, and making the world aware of our commitment to becoming stronger. When we do that, we achieve things that others would not have thought possible. You see, this is not science that I developed. This is what leaders have been living from the time of Jesus, from the time uh, immemorial until today. We need to celebrate every achievement. We need to express our appreciation for the blessings that come our way. And by all means, we need to be authentic. It is that path that I use to try and teach people in prison, where these courses that I create are used in juvenile halls and prisons across the United States, including the Bureau of Prisons and including right here in the state of California. I use it to teach students because young people can follow this path and adhere to it as well, as I have done at the Sunburst Academy here in Orange County, California. I use this program to teach staff members who work with students. And most importantly, for people in this audience, I use it to teach facilitators in school so that we can have this type of peer-to-peer -peer teaching where facilitators can learn this course, this principled 10-part course, and use it to interact with their peers and lead them into becoming stronger, more disciplined, leading values-based, goal-oriented lives so that they can develop intrinsic motivation, so that they can develop the types of critical thinking skills that will help them reject the negativity, reject the bad decisions, and focus on how they can analyze what's going on around them, ask the right questions, make the right decisions, become aware of what they can do, always evaluating how today's decisions influences tomorrow's success. Through this peer-to-peer -peer programming and teaching, we are able to really overcome the barriers that so many of you face in trying to achieve the objectives that you're trying to achieve, which is the inherent bias of young people against authority. We are able to overcome the distrust. We are able to help them see that it's not important to save face, but rather to stay focused on our values and goals. We strive to help them overcome the self-deceptions that they can't be more than current struggles or help them overcome fears of change or help them overcome poor reading skills by doing what? By teaching this course through exercises and through questioning and through peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And all of that is how we build safer communities. Well, that's what I would like to offer through this program to the safe schools. And I'd like to follow through with this by going through an exercise with everybody here in our workshop. I'd like you to begin by identifying a value category in your life. Take some time. Let's take five minutes and break into groups. And I'd love for you to develop, to spend that time developing two or three or one value category because that is the prerequisite to embarking upon the Straight A Guide. And then we want to say, what specific goals can we create that will determine whether we are authentic? If we achieve those goals, we are on it. If we don't, it doesn't mean we failed. It just means we've got to pick ourselves up and do it again. I'd love for you to do that, and then we can work together in going through the Straight A Guide. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce this program, and I look forward to working with you together. My name is Michael. I am with michaelsantos.com or prisonprofessors.com. Reach out to us. We will do our best to help you build the safe schools to increase your graduation levels, to build intrinsic motivation for the people that you serve, and hopefully build safer communities. Thank you.